For the next several years, Hoffa worked behind the scenes to regain his presidency, but by 1975, the battle between him and Fitzsimmons was out in the open and was about to get violent. It's the spring of 1975, and Hoffa and his former protege, Frank Fitzsimmons, are embroiled in a bitter power struggle for the Teamsters' presidency. Mr. Fitzsimmons, at this point, is firmly ensconced in Hoffa's old-time presidency seat, and members of the mafia that had once helped Hoffa attain the presidency are pretty content with keeping Fitzsimmons in the post. In the midst of this battle with Fitzsimmons over the Teamsters' presidency, Hoffa called for a meeting at Nemo's Bar in downtown Detroit, ostensibly to come to some agreement with his rival. Hoffa never showed, but Fitzsimmons and his son did, Richard Little Fitz Fitzsimmons. They had lunch here at Nemo's, and while they, while they left and headed to the parking lot out to their car, their car blew up. A bomb had detonated. The bombing of suspected mafia puppet Frank Fitzsimmons didn't sit well with either the Detroit family nor with certain powerful mobsters on the East Coast, most notably Anthony Tony Pro Provenzano, whom Hoffa had fought with in the mess hall at Atlanta Federal Prison years earlier. Following the bombing incident at Nemo's in May of 1975, Hoffa was living on borrowed time. Less than two months later, Hoffa was called to a meeting at the Marcus Red Fox in Bluefield Hills, Michigan, to have a sit-down with two very powerful mobsters, one being Tony Giacalone, the Detroit Mafia street boss, the other being Tony Provenzano, a New Jersey mafiosi. Hoffa was supposed to meet him at the Marcus Red Fox restaurant and then go with him to a meeting. By July 30th, 1975, when Hoffa was called to a meeting here, he was living on borrowed time. Six weeks previous, he had been suspected in playing a role in the bombing of uh, his successor in the Teamsters presidency, Frank Fitzsimmons, and his son, Little Fitz, Richard Fitzsimmons' car was blown up outside of Nemo's. This uh, upset the Detroit Mafia and really made Hoffa's execution slash disappearance a priority. Hoffa's diary entry for the day he went missing lists Tony Provenzano, Tony Giacalone, and Leonard Schultz, who was also the man that Harvey Leach was going to see before he came up missing, as the people he was going to meet at the Marcus Red Fox restaurant in suburban Detroit. Giacalone was to be present at the meeting between Tony Pro and Hoffa as the Detroit family's representative, following mob protocol. If a family from somewhere else wanted to come here and do something in Detroit, they need to get permission from the Detroit people to do it. So even if you subscribe to the theory that the people ultimately responsible are, in fact, from the East Coast, the, the LCN structure would have required approval, authorization, and participation by the Detroit family. Provenzano is one of three people Hoffa apparently thought he was going to meet that day. Names of the others, reportedly recalled by a witness who underwent hypnosis, were Leonard Schultz, a Detroit labor consultant with a long criminal record, and Anthony Giacalone, described as an important figure in the Detroit Mafia. Tony Jack never showed up for his meeting with Jimmy Hoffa, but he was sure to make his face seen around the Southfield Athletic Club, which was being managed by his old buddy Leonard Schultz around the time Hoffa went missing. Hey, Jimmy Hoffa disappeared. He was in the building here getting his shoes shined, asking yeah, everybody what, what time Tony Jack was. didn't talk to anyone yeah. ever, but on, on, on July 30th, 1975, he, everyone that walked past him, he, asked, uh, he said hi and how, what time it was. Police haven't talked to Giacalone yet, but through an associate, Giacalone has offered an alibi for last Wednesday. He says he spent midday Wednesday at this office building in nearby Southfield, meeting his accountant and his attorney. Then he says he went to the Southfield Athletic Club, got a haircut and a rub down. Seemingly stood up for his meeting, Hoffa milled around the Marcus Red Fox and made a phone call from a nearby hardware store. Soon after, a sedan with three men pulled up and Jimmy Hoffa got in. He has never been seen since. As soon as Jimmy Hoffa left this parking lot around 2.45 on July 30th, 1975, he immediately became one of America's most infamous unsolved missing persons cases in the history of American crime. Police continue today to run down anonymous tips, such as one that said Hoffa's body could be found in this lake. Police searched, the report proved false. At day's end, police still didn't seem much closer to knowing what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. The government, well, technically the government probably knows who did it and how it was done, but and has some evidence, but not enough to indict because 
the people who actually did it are either now deceased or very close mouth and they're just not talking. Of course, that wasn't the end of the story of Jimmy Hoffa. The FBI continued its investigation for years, focusing, for one thing, on the fact that Vito Giacalone, Tony's brother, was the only member of the Detroit mob hierarchy unaccounted for by surveillance teams that day. Billy Giacalone, a captain and the brother of street boss Tony Giacalone, was unaccounted for that day by FBI surveillance. Between 10 o'clock that morning and around 5 o'clock that afternoon, Giacalone was off the radar. A lot of FBI agents believe that, that the reason why is because Jack Loney was the Detroit mob's representative at the Hoffa hit. And certainly because it's in this area on his turf or on their turf, uh, a representative is going to have to be here. He would be the most logical person, coupled with the fact that nobody saw him that day. Uh, now, again, since 1975, there have been many, numerous theories that have uh, abounded about where Hoffa was taken, how he was done away with. One, one theory that has recently come to light and didn't really come to light during the uh, main focus of the Hoffa investigation in the late 70s, and this theory was uh, proffered to me by a number of FBI agents that worked the case, and with their perspective now looking back on the case, they feel like this theory could be uh, a real missing link in the investigation. Now, that theory is that Hoffa was taken to this house off Long Lake Road in Bloomfield Hills, a mere less than two miles away from the Marcus Red Fox. Although this house right now was previously owned at the time of the Hoffa disappearance by Carlo Lakata, a Detroit Mafia soldier and the brother-in-law of Jack Toko and Tony Toko. The Lakata house itself became the site of a strange incident that bore all the hallmarks of the Detroit Mafia family in 1981. On the six-year anniversary of Hoffa's disappearance, July 30th, 1981, when Carlo Lakata, Jack Toko's brother-in-law, was found dead at this location. Now, uh, Lakata was found uh, in his master bedroom with uh, two gunshot wounds to the chest and the gun uh, several feet away from the body. Originally, this, uh, this death was ruled a suicide, but uh, there are many, many, uh, several uh, law enforcement agents that believe that there's more to meet the eye than merely a suicide here, and that the fact that Lakata's death happened on the six-year anniversary of the Hoffa disappearance says something and relates to the Hoffa uh, uh, assassination to the degree that possibly Lakata knew a little bit too much and was, was using that as a trump card, and possibly the Detroit Mafia killed him uh, as a message to everyone else that even those closest to us will be done away with. And the fact that uh, Carl Lakata was Jack Toko's brother-in-law really didn't seem to uh, matter, at least according to these FBI uh, agents' theories on the Hoffa uh, assassination. But this house right here, the former house of Carl Lakata, definitely, although has not got the notoriety of some other theories, definitely plays a major role in possibly what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. With Jimmy Hoffa's unsolved disappearance fresh in the minds of the federal government, they decided to go after the Detroit family street boss, Tony Jack, in another way, income tax evasion. The IRS had been dogged. They had looked at him primarily because they thought they could find something when it was much more difficult for, for example, the FBI to find a, a routine, usual crime that required someone on the spot to testify against them. So the IRS did a very good job, very, very, very thorough. Now I'm Richard Zuckerman. When I was assigned to the Organized Crime Strike Force in Detroit, the third case I was assigned to was a tax prosecution of Anthony Giacalone for income tax evasion. And the case against Tony Jack centered around his inability to account for all the money he and his wife spent to support their lavish lifestyle. Uh, it's quite clear that he, he wanted and lived a, a polished, sophisticated existence. Uh, he's not one of the guys that you would see, you know, like uh, in some movie. His defense centered around the assertion that his father, a fruit peddler in Eastern Market in the early part of the century, had left Tony as the eldest son an inheritance of $300,000 upon his death all saved up during his years of selling apples and grapes for pennies and nickels. Needless to say, it didn't work. I'm along with uh, Mike Carone here and Bill Randall, uh, two former FBI agents that worked the uh, OC unit in Detroit from uh, the late 70s all the way up until just a couple years ago into the uh, uh, new millennium. Jack Loney's primarily being the uh, street bosses, as you mentioned, 
uh, were of particular interest to us because they were the ones that seemed to be always doing something day to day. Uh, the trial went seven months, five days a week. It was very long, was designed around uh, the same type of prosecution that got Al Capone. It was probably a larger, longer case than the Capone case. Tony Giacalone was convicted of income tax evasion in 1976, though he didn't enter federal prison until 79. In a separate case, the state of Michigan convicted Giacalone of extortion, his 12-year state sentence to be served concurrently with his 10-year federal sentence. We introduced evidence that he went to a prominent Jewish businessman in the, in the area of uh, Flint and told him that he needed an insurance policy because a contract had been put out on his life and he would need to come up with a $25,000 premium to avoid, uh, to avoid having something unfortunate happen. In fact, the guy did pay. Giacalone's relatively long sentences showed just how anxious the government was to get Tony Jack off the streets for as long as they could. His sentence was Fair, was very significant in terms of what people were getting in those days for tax evasion. As the 1970s passed by, both Billy Goots and Mario Fascioni broke their ties with the mob. Mario Fascioni joined the Mormon church and told his mafia benefactor that he was quitting the business. When I sat down in front of him, and you know, it was over at a warehouse over on I-94 in Trumbull there, and, and when, I, when I walked in, there was like maybe, I don't know, 10 guys, and my uncle was standing in the back with a baseball bat. Boy, he wanted to nail me so bad. He, my uncle was a tough individual. He was a uh, uh, no conscience kind of a guy, and, and then they just start ripping on me something horrible. I just said, you know, I spent the stuzzy to be quiet. Let me tell you. So I just told him what I did, and uh, I told him that, uh, I just bore my testimony to him, telling him that whatever you guys got to do, do it, because I know what I'm doing is right. He looked at me and he got a smile and he leaned forward and he took his finger and he pointed at me and he said, you do what these people want you to do. He said, I got nothing ever to worry about. He says, you don't. He says, you, your dad, your family going to evaporate. He said, get the heck out of here. Billy Goots drifted away from Sam Fanazzo but continued managing boxers, eventually guiding Lindell Holmes to the IBF super middleweight belt in 1990. Once that gym went under, then there was really no connection with Sam, you know, and I just went my way and he went his way. But when I'd see him periodically, you know, parties, dinners, and Anytime my kids had anything going, he would, him and Pearl were invited. Just after Tony Jack's conviction, two more high-ranking members of the family were indicted and convicted for extortion in a case involving a Wisconsin company that made cheese for pizza parlors. When I first came to the U.S. Attorney's Office, I was assigned to the Controlled Substance Unit. Then after I'd been there about four or five months, they came down and asked if anybody was interested in working on a Special case. Jimmy Quasarano, suspected key member of the Detroit Heroin Pipeline, and Bozzi Vitale helped the cheese company collect debts from mafia-controlled pizza parlors on the East Coast. Uh, they went back and asked uh, Quasarano and Vitale to assist again, and they said, well, this time it's going to cost you some money. Jimmy Q and Bozzi moved in for the kill, effectively taking over the company and lining their own pockets with company money and you're highly in debt to these guys, you can't pay your debt up. If, if you're not paying, they're gonna find a way to get into your business. It's gonna be coming in the front door, going out the back door, and you can't pay, and next thing you know, you're bankrupt. Around this time, the Detroit LCN was gaining control of the Frontier Casino in Las Vegas, and the FBI began an investigation into the Detroit Combination's activities in the deserts of Nevada. In addition to the traditional rackets that are the lifeblood of any mafia family, like sports gambling, loan sharking, and extortion, the Detroit Mafia had its hook in an even bigger cash cow, Las Vegas. In the early 1960s, Detroit fronted the money for the Frontier Hotel and Casino. Joe Zarelli appointed as point man on the Las Vegas rackets his son, Anthony Tony Z. Zarelli, and future conciliary Michael Big Mike Polizzi. The Frontier case was one of the first hidden ownership cases. 
involving a Las Vegas casino, the Frontier Hotel. Tony Zerilli and Mike Polizzi ended up getting convicted of skimming money from the casino and ended up having to do jail time. Joe Zerilli at this point had to make a decision. Tony Zerilli, his son, had been chosen to be his heir apparent, the next boss of the Detroit Mafia family. But his imprisonment and his escapades in Las Vegas raised a red flag with his father. Joe Zerilli was worried that maybe Tony Zerilli wasn't the best man to lead the family. So Zerilli at this point made a very controversial decision. He demoted Tony Zerilli while he was serving his time on the Frontier bus and promoted his nephew, Black Jack Toko, Giacomo Toko. In 1976, FBI agent William Keane testified in front of the Nevada Gaming Commission concerning the licensing of one James Tamer to work at the Aladdin Casino in Las Vegas. He testified that he had observed multiple meetings between Charles Goldfarb, Mr. Tamer, and Vito Giacalone at the Chuck Joseph's Place for Steak restaurant in Detroit. At these meetings, the Detroit Mafia's control and influence at the Aladdin Casino was discussed, with Vito Giacalone mentioning the possible loss of money from the Teamsters Pension Fund if certain problems weren't solved. We're standing in front of Goldfarb Surety Bonds. Goldfarb Bonds is owned by Charles Goldfarb on the streets known as Chucky G. Chucky Goldfarb, in addition to being a frontman for the Detroit Mob's ventures into Las Vegas for the Latin, was also known as a uh, kind of a bail bondsman to the stars of the street of Detroit. Uh, in the 1970s, he kind of made a name for himself by bail going to New York City and bailing out legendary New York crime kingpin Leroy Hollywood Nicky Barnes. And more recently, kind of made a name for himself in the local press by bailing out uh, former Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick. On March 13, 1979, the Aladdin Hotel Corporation and four individuals, James Tamer, Edward Monism, Charles Goldfarb, and James Abraham, were convicted of allowing hidden interests to exert control over the casino. In 1976, an East Coast race-fixing team with mob connections descended upon Detroit. They set up shop here at Derby's. This race fixing team was led by a legendary race fixer across the country by the name of Anthony Tony the Fixer Chula. Chula was taught in the ways of the underworld by legendary mobster James Whitey Bulger, who led the Boston's Irish Mafia for much of the 20th century. Even with Tony Jack and capos like Jimmy Q going on trial, the action didn't stop. In 1976, the family set up another money-making caper at their old stomping grounds, the Hazel Park Racetrack. Shula and his race fixing team, which consisted of about five other guys, made an arrangement to begin fixing races here in Detroit and giving the Detroit Mafia a piece of the action. Because of Shula's connections to the Detroit Mafia, he gained access to stables, jockeys, and so forth, which gave him the ability to manipulate race outcomes. Shula's operation was finally taken down in 1978 by the FBI task force. Under intense interrogation by FBI authorities, Shula finally broke. And in 1978, late 1978, Chula turned FBI informant and began informing on his former cohorts in the Mafia. Freddie the Pope Salem was a fixture on the Detroit gambling circuit from the 1960s into the new millennium. A world-class pool player in a game played mostly by serious gamblers called One Pocket, Salem was an Italian but he had the charisma and talents to rise to a position of unquestioned power and authority in the Detroit La Cosa Nostra clan. We're here on Capitol Street in Oak Park in front of the former site of the Capitol Street Social Club, headquarters of Detroit Mafia gambling lieutenant Freddie the Saint Salem through most of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Salem was unique on the streets of Detroit for several reasons, but first off, for the fact that he was Syrian, there are very few syndicates that would allow a non-made member or a non-Italian to reach the heights that Salem reached. He had a crew of up to about 10 people that ran different gambling rackets for them, and Salem's status on the streets of Detroit actually equaled, if not exceeded, a lot, a lot of made members of the Detroit Mafia. In Detroit, membership in the organized crime family was limited to those of Sicilian background. People like Alan Hilf and Freddie Salem were always believed by the government and were indicted on, on numerous occasions for their involvement. They had a lot of power because they generated a lot of income. Freddie Salem, I, I like Freddie. He, he was a gentleman. He was, uh, I think everybody uh, thought that of him. Um, I had to arrest him one time. He followed me downtown, parked the car, he got in my car, and then uh, we took him inside, processed him. One good thing about our Detroit La Cosa Nostra family, they will utilize everybody and anybody that befriends them um, uh, that they trust, but of course, 
they, again, trust them only to a degree. The FBI was finally able to infiltrate one of Salem's dice games located on Elmira Street in Northeast Detroit with an undercover agent. And you were known, you, you knew that Salem was, even though not a made member, uh, Freddie Salem, known as the Freddie the Saint, Four Horse Freddie, Freddie the Pope, whatnot, uh, was probably the premier non-Italian uh, mob associate and was reporting directly to Tony Giacalone and his brother. Absolutely. The clientele of the games ranged widely, but they all had one thing in common. They liked to spend money. You'd have a bunch of uh, topless uh, dancers that would come in there, the after hours drinking, drug, you know, use of drugs. Pretty high stakes uh, crap schemes going on. I mean, $15,000, $20,000 pots would not be uncommon. When the Elmira Street game was raided in the late 70s, dozens of arrests were made, along with numerous guns and tens of thousands in cash being seized from the little wood frame house that served as Salem's crown jewel at the time. October 1977, Joe Zerilli dies after 40 years of being the boss of the Detroit La Cosa Nostra. Zerilli had been the longest serving Don in the country and had for many years probably served as the consigliere of the National Mafia Commission itself, mediating disputes between the New York Dons and advising other mob bosses around the country. Zerilli had lived a low key life, rarely leaving his various estates in the Detroit area, never being recorded by the government and avoiding any serious legal problems. By the time of his death, Joe Uno had built the Detroit family into an efficient and unbreakable money-making machine. But his legacy had failed in one key area, his son Tony. We're standing here at the Eight and a Half in Ryan in front of the former uh, corporate headquarters of Bellamy Pasta and Sauce in the Spaghetti Palace. Uh, two infamous Detroit Mafia front businesses that were owned by Detroit underboss Tony Zerilli. Now, Zerilli would spend uh, a lot of afternoons between uh, the early, mid 1960s all the way up until the 1980s uh, at his digs here at uh, the corporate headquarters of uh, Bellamy Pasta and, and Spaghetti Palace. In the early 70s, Tony Z, as Zerilli was called on the street, was tapped to be the next boss and replace his father when he died. Tony Zerilli and Jack Toko were really uh, the two mob princes coming up uh, in the 1940s and 50s and were really looked at as the future of the family by their fathers, Black Bill Toko and Joe Zerilli, who were the founding fathers of the family, obviously. Zerilli and Toko, the younger Zerilli and Toko, kind of started off on the same uh, trajectory, parallel to each other, with uh, Tony Zerilli kind of being at the forefront and, and Jack being at the back. But their, uh, their careers in the underworld around here kind of diverged and went in two different paths as the years went on. Zerilli had been demoted by his father after numerous blunders that led to the Detroit family being kicked out of Las Vegas. His cousin Jack Toko was now poised to become the new boss. The top capos and consigliere of the combination paid respects to the new Don Jack Toko, all except one. Tony Zerilli was conspicuously absent from the proceedings. I'm standing here with Keith Corbett, uh, more than 20 years a member of the U.S. Prosecutor's Office and one of the primary nemesis of the Detroit Mafia here in Detroit. I noticed significant differences between the family structure in New York and the family structure in Detroit. It was much more difficult to infiltrate much more difficult to get a handle. In 1979, Jack Topo took over. He's different than a lot of the LCN bosses in New York in that he's college educated. He had no prior convictions. Toko continued to rule in the secretive and sophisticated manner of Joe Zarelli, never talking on phones, rarely being seen in public, and using the Jackaloni brothers as a buffer between himself and the street. With his brother Tony off serving federal and state prison terms, Vito Giacalone stepped into his shoes, taking control of loan sharking and gambling operations in the late 70s. Vito, using his enforcers Bobby LaPuma and Ronnie Morelli, took a more active role in the black numbers rackets and was arrested in a massive $800,000 a day gambling conspiracy in 1977. Vito ended up being the only one of the five ringleaders found not guilty, but by now, the federal government had him firmly in their sights. In the early 1980s, Vito Billy Jack Giacalone returned to his old stomping grounds and set up a headquarters 
here uh, on, the, on the intersection of Adelaide and Rio Pelli in Eastern Market. Uh, the business was called Farm Fresh Produce and it was uh, ran by his son Jackie and his son-in-law. He was there often and they would conduct a lot of business on the street in Eastern Market. And uh, Vito, at this point, had taken over his own crew and was in charge of all gambling and loan sharking in the uh, Detroit area, taking over the business that was previously owned by his brother Tony and before that, Machine Gun Pete Corrado. He was given control over uh, uh, Ohio in the city of Toledo. Uh, Myself and another guy were out at a uh, golf course uh, watching Billy Jackaloni. He got on a payphone. We got an over here that he was uh, getting direction somewhere. And, um, and we followed him. He ended up down at Toledo. Ohio with Sal Vitello and they were uh, getting ready to muscle in on the uh, cartage business down there. Vito's activities both in Toledo and Detroit were under constant scrutiny and in 1982 the FBI was finally able to spring their trap. But also he was he was a, a fan of doing walk and talks coming outside of the building and kind of walking on this street. Now the FBI picked up on this and actually placed bugs in telephone poles that would pick up the conversation between Billy and his associates, a lot of time being his son Jackie, who at the time was really coming on the scene as a major player at that point. Uh, Vito was indicted again in 1982, but this time the federal government had an unbeatable case. Vito and his son Jackie, along with several of their henchmen, were convicted of various gambling violations and sent to federal prison for a brief time. And this telephone pole is one of the last remaining uh, uh, remnants of, of the Jackaloni's time here because this, this telephone pole right here was what ended up actually sending these guys to jail. 1985, the Detroit Mafia cleans house. At least 10 different homicides in Metro Detroit during 1985 bore the signs of being mob related, including two different triple murders. In 1984, the FBI had estimated the family's strength at less than 40 members. So perhaps 1985 was another year in which the proverbial books were opened and new members brought into the family by making their bones. Perhaps the rash of killings were related to Tony Jackaloni's impending release from federal prison early the following year. And no murder was more important than that of Pete Cavatayo, up-and-coming soldier in the family and brother-in-law to the infamous Corrados. Stand here in the shadow of the Ambassador Bridge in the Delray section of the southwest portion of Detroit. In July of 1985, the last made member of the Detroit Mafia to be killed, Pete Cavatayo, his body was found on a street not far away from here. Cavatayo married into the Corrado family. He married the daughter of machine gun Pete Corrado. His brother-in-laws were Dominic Fats Corrado and Anthony Tony the Bull Corrado. Cavatile at one point in the 1960s was viewed as a future leader of the Detroit mob. However, that did not pan out. Cavatile's temper proved a bugaboo, as well as his penchant for sleeping with certain members' wives and girlfriends. He, Pete Cavatile to me was a low-class guy. I mean, he's dead now, God bless him, but you know. Cavatile's body was found on Harvey Street, uh, battered and tortured, bolt in the back of his head, as well as uh, several wounds from a heated knife being plunged into his body in order to try to reveal the whereabouts of a safe where members of the Detroit mob thought he was holding some money that he had possibly stolen. The Cavatile homicide went cold until the early 1990s when a Jackaloni crew member by the name of John Pree was arrested for a home invasion. John Pree was running buddies with Carlo Bomarito son of Frank Bomarito, who had been convicted several years earlier for conspiring to murder Ernie Kanakis, and together they had been embroiled in various escapades, such as being accused of committing arson against a sanitation company that refused to cooperate. Pree's home invasion arrest included Bomarito as a co-defendant. The two were accused of robbing an Oakland County heroin dealer on the orders of the Jackaloni brothers. Pree for a short period of time, turned, turned government witness, debriefed the FBI, and admitted to playing a role in the Cavatayo murder on the instructions of the Jackaloni brothers. Pre eventually recanted his testimony, and the case was never brought to trial, and no charges were ever filed. While Pre was convicted, Bomarito was cleared of the charges. Pre to this day is still in prison on the home invasion charge, and the Cavatayo murder, although not officially solved, in the minds of the FBI, they have a pretty good idea of who did it and how it went down. 
So when we talk about the Detroit mob and their penchant uh, for gangland homicides, I think that you can make a parallel between uh, kind of the reputation as, a, as an entity, as a whole syndicate, as being very under the radar and low key and, and very business savvy to the way they actually go about on their enforcement and their murders where that a lot of their murders are under the, uh, very under the radar and very suspicious and very, can, you know, lots of conjecture. Was it a murder? Was it a suicide? Was it an overdose? Yes. And they do have that reputation as being like one of those least violent mafia families in the United States. Um, in my research, I haven't really found that to be completely true. And that's really kind of what we were saying before. I mean, they're very, they're able to put a veneer over it, which really kind of leaves question about whether it was a murder, whether it wasn't. Yes, whether it was a suicide, whether it was a drug overdose, whether it was an accident, things like that is a, definitely a, seems to be a method of operations for the Detroit mob because it's statistically unlikely that this number of people would die in these bizarre right. circumstances. And they're very good at covering their tracks. I mean, no... Uh, modern day member of the Detroit Mafia, uh, nor any, anyone for you know, at least over 50 years has ever been charged or put, you know, gone to jail for a mob related murder. When was the last? The last one that happened was in 1934. Um, and that so was... it's been, I mean, 80 years, almost 80 years since a member of the Detroit Mafia has actually gone away for a murder. Somebody will end up dead and they'll end up surfacing. And uh, we, we have strong belief that it was possibly a mob related hit. Um, hasn't been a bunch of that because, again, uh, coming out from our shop uh, with regards to convictions, um, it's a pretty tight-lipped family. If they don't know you, you're just not going to be privy to that. By now, sports gambling had become the lifeblood of the Detroit Mafia, serving as a nexus point for both loan sharking and extortion operations on area gamblers. Now, I have actually seen a check written by one defendant, one gambling victim who lost a million dollars. That's a single check, which cleared, by the way. This was a legitimate businessman who lost, on one bet on the Super Bowl, one million dollars. It's the summer of 1990, and the Detroit Pistons are getting ready to win back-to-back -back NBA championships. But Piston star Isaiah Thomas was embroiled in a media frenzy that centered around allegations of his involvement in an Allen Hilf-led gambling ring. It was a status symbol when you would have games at, let's say, for instance, Tommy Hearn's house in Southfield or Isaiah Thomas's house in Bloomfield Hills, which were two locations that were implicated in an indictment in 1990, uh, in which Salem was said to have been running uh, high-profile, very high-stakes craps games in the basement of both Hearn's and Thomas's house. A local attorney subpoenaed in the case testified that these elite gambling parties were frequented by a mostly black and Middle Eastern clientele of drug dealers, liquor store owners, and professional athletes. The indictment broke on the eve of the Detroit Pistons repeating as NBA champions in 1990. Thomas's name came to light when it was revealed that his neighbor, grocery store owner Emmett Denha, had cashed over $100,000 in personal checks for Thomas. What happened was Denha had a market where he was able to get large sums of cash, and the, the LCN figures used Denha's market to take the gambling proceeds and convert them into cash. Emmett wanted to be liked by a lot of people, and uh, I don't think the feeling was mutual. I think he was being used. They took advantage of that because he was a degenerate gambler. They probably gave him a break on some of his uh, losses, and, uh, and he cashed checks for him, cashed very big checks, and he got into trouble for it. So. Isaiah Thomas was cleared of any wrongdoing, but Denha, along with Alan Hilf, Jackie Jackaloni, and Billy Jackaloni, were all indicted and convicted. When Billy Jackaloni was convicted of uh, tax evasion, uh, what happened was Jackaloni and his lawyer, D.D. Loren, received money from an individual by the name of Al Allen. He wrote a large number of checks. Those checks were then given to Denha, who ran them through a supermarket, converted the checks into cash, gave the checks to Jack Jackaloni, who in turn passed them along to his father. It was a bloodless hit carried out by federal agents heavily armed with arrest warrants. The FBI today busted the leaders of Detroit's mafia. It's the FBI's latest attack on organized crime in America's big cities. But despite the crackdown, the top FBI official says what he calls the Cosa Nostra remains, and I quote, the most significant organized crime threat in America. They were easily one of the most successful mafia families left in America until today. You're saying you guys are big players in the mafia. Is that true? Your father is. 
The Gamtax case was the first real chance for the federal government to dismantle the Detroit family like they had been doing to mob families all across the country during the late 80s and early 90s. The U.S. Attorney's Office here in the Eastern District of Michigan, I believe it was in March of 1996, brought down a, a multi-count indictment uh, on the majority of what was alleged to have been the hierarchy of the Detroit family of the Cosa Nostra. In coordinated raids, the FBI swooped up 17 members of the Detroit chapter of La Cosa Nostra, including all its top leaders. We're taking out the whole hierarchy, and that's what the significance of this particular investigation is. The nine of the, uh, the people arrested were made members, were the, the historical uh, leadership of this family for the past 30 years. In the case of Gamtax, we targeted the Detroit organized crime family, and we dealt with criminal activity dating back as, as far as the early, the mid-60s, all the way up to the date of the indictment, which was the mid-90s. The Detroit mob did it the old-fashioned way, the Justice Department said, by bombing some businesses into submission, extorting others, and even making a run at controlling the clubs in Las Vegas. The big break for the government came through the incompetence of two of the family's soldiers, Novi Toko and Paul Carrado. Toko and Corrado, despite their infamous last names, were still working the streets, and in the mid-90s decided to organize their own numbers racket extortion ring. They decided that uh, they were going to generate some income collecting a tribute from bookmakers and numbers runners who were operating in the Detroit, organized, uh, in the Detroit area. They were gonna uh, take a monthly or bi-weekly payment from these guys in order to be allowed to run a, uh, a numbers business or run a bookmaking business. This is a street tax shakedown right, scam. Right. There were a lot of them that were Middle Eastern, and they went to them and they said, if you want to continue to function and continue to run your business, you've got to pay us for the opportunity to do that. But soon after they started shaking down mostly Middle Eastern bookmakers and numbers runners, their car was bugged, and Novi Toko and Paul Corrado talked themselves and the rest of the family straight into prison. They complained about the, uh, the hierarchy of the LCN not giving them a chance to make money, that they had theirs and they didn't care about the little guys who were trying to make their way. They, at one point in time, they were having difficulty collecting from a particular uh, bookmaker, so they discussed either setting off a bomb in, his, uh, in the parking lot of his business on Michigan Avenue. They ultimately decided to shoot a gun through his window. Now, uh, Tony's really once again got in trouble uh, in the 1990s, along with the whole family in the GAM tax bus, but what was specifically disturbing to Jack Toko and the rest of the administration was that Tony Zarelli was actually caught on tape, on surveillance, uh, audio surveillance coming out of cars uh, being driven by his nephew, uh, Nove Toko, and uh, cousin Polly Corrado. Jack is someone who is notoriously uh, uh, very uh, hard to get on audio surveillance, and someone who's probably only been picked up by the FBI audio surveillance people uh, less than a dozen times in his whole career. Uh, Tony's really has not been so lucky and has been caught on tape several times, including the GAM tax bus. With oh, I, I think the, the fact that Novi is his nephew, that he approved Novi's activities, that he authorized what Novi did, and that he himself was ultimately caught on tape discussing with Novi taking action against the civilian, not a person in any way directly involved in the LCN, all caused people to say, but for Novi Toko and, and his, his uncle Anthony Zarelli, we might not be here in this particular case in London. Jack Toko later blamed Zarelli in large part for the Gamtax convictions, and Zarelli's criminal career came to a dead end after 50 plus years as a made man. Uh, as I said before, Zarelli did a jail term, and when he came out last April, he's been persona non grata with the Detroit Mafia. Rumor on the street is that Jack Toko was so upset with him for his behavior, he's taken his stripes away, knocked him down from underboss, and put him on the shelf. Tony Zarelli's been walking around town kind of uh, not in the best of light, looking for money. Uh, Jack Toko apparently won't take his calls, and uh, Tony Zarelli's not really at the point that I think he thought he'd be sitting here in his 80s now. And it really kind of tells the story of two first cousins in Jack Toko and Tony Zerilli and kind of the past that they both took. Uh, and as we are today, Tony Zerilli is really not in the fold anymore. Jack Toko is still on top. It really tells the whole story. Boss Jack Toko, his brother Tony, along with Anthony the Bull Corrado, Big Polly Corrado, and Novi Toko all went to trial in 1998. 
with the exception of reputed consigliere Tony Toko, who was believed to have taken over as acting boss when his older brother Jack was sentenced to time in prison, all the main targets of the Gamtax prosecution were convicted. But, but each one of the three counts on which Jack Toko was convicted, uh, two RICO counts and a conspiracy to commit extortion, each carried a 20-year uh, maximum sentence. Jack Toko had been found guilty by the jury of being the head of the Detroit La Cosa Nostra family and directing and allowing his subordinates to carry out various criminal activities dating back into the 1960s. The trial judge in the case of, uh, of Jack Toko elected to give him one year and one day in prison. Toko's lenient sentence shocked the government. Federal prosecutors appealed the sentence two different times with little result, and Toko ultimately served less than three years in prison. All the other defendants who were convicted, Novi Toko, Paul Corrado, and, and Dominic Corrado, and ultimately Tony Zarelli, all received much more significant sentences than that. Novi was able to get an early release because he agreed to cooperate with the government, but Jack Toko got a, a relatively uh, minor sentence, much less than would be suggested by a person whom the jury determined to be the head of the family and the person responsible for all the activities committed by all the other people. But John Corbett O'Meara, U.S. District Court judge, elected to give him the sentence. Uh, Jack Coco can never go around anymore and claim to be a businessman. He's a convicted racketeer and a convicted extortionist, and that's going to follow him forever and he can never deny that and he can never hold himself out again as a pillar of the community in my judgment. Well, Jack Toko was convicted in 1998 as being the boss of the Detroit family of La Cosa Nostra. I, I believe they referred to it as the combination. Uh, Jack Toko um, it came out in trial. He relayed messages through his underlings, Capo, to carry out uh, the business that they needed to carry out. Tony Giacalone and Tony Zarelli were severed from the main game tax trial due to health reasons. Tony Giacalone, the public face of Detroit's La Cosa Nostra for nearly 40 years, died of cancer in 2001 before going to trial. Tony Z finally went to trial himself in 2002 and was convicted of multiple RICO law violations. The late 1990s and into the new millennium were undoubtedly the most difficult period in the Detroit family's history, but Tony Toko and Jackie the Kid Jagaloni were still on the street and it was still business as usual. We're standing here off 8 Mile, the uh, infamous 8 Mile Road, made famous uh, by Eminem's movie 8 Mile, is notorious for uh, separating uh, the suburbs from the Detroit, uh, city of Detroit proper. Uh, dozens of strip clubs kind of line this uh, road right here and have traditionally paid uh, uh, the street tax to the Detroit La Cosa Nostra. Now, uh, back in 2001, uh, at this intersection right here, this turnaround on Evergreen and 8 Mile was the site of possibly the last mob murder in Detroit. John Jarjosa was a family associate sent to prison in the Gamtax bus for helping shake down strip clubs in Metro Detroit. While he was gone, his son, John Jr., was left to run their family strip club, John John's, on Mound Road, as well as several others. Now, uh, Jarjosa Jr. was actually stalked on the afternoon of his death. He left a strip club that him and his father owned called City Heat, which was several miles uh, uh, east of here, and was going to do a workout at Valley's, came up this road, was making a turnaround here at Evergreen, and was boxed in by two cars. Uh, one of the members of uh, one of the cars got out and unloaded a clip into Mr. Jarjosa Jr. in his car. He died. Uh, although the FBI has not categorized this as a mob murder, a lot of people believe that it, it had possible mob Ties. And if you go down several miles east of here to Aiton Gratiot, you find the new headquarters of reputed uh, current Detroit LCN capo, Frank Frankie the Bomb Bomberito. Uh, Frankie Bomb has set up a new headquarters over at Aiton Gratiot, Danny Boy's Social Club, where he holds court. That area, which is kind of the borderline between Warren and Detroit, has always been Frankie Bomb's territory, and he runs it with an iron fist. Now, uh, Frankie Bomb is one of the more elderly reputed capos, but Make no mistake about it, there is a highly skilled and uh, very proficient group of uh, administrators standing behind them, ready to take their place. I'm talking about guys like Jackie the Kid Jackaloni, uh, reputed capos Tony Pal Palazzola and Anthony Tony, uh, Chicago Tony Lafiano. 
guys that uh, the uh, several authorities believe will be the next powers to take over the Detroit Mafia. And needless to say, uh, the Detroit Mafia in the future uh, is uh, pretty safe and sound from this point forward. The government had high hopes that the Gamtax case would put the Detroit combination out of business. But a decade later, RICO indictments and conspiracy cases are still being made against the family for similar crimes to those outlined in the Gamtax case. Jack V. Giacalone, who's the son of Billy Giacalone, has been convicted uh, himself in the past of gambling and RICO and has a... And uh, Pete Toko, who was uh, Jack's nephew and uh, was Alleged recently Capo, convicted, just recently got... Right, uh, uh, right as, as recently as 2006, uh, four or five members of the Detroit LCN were convicted in another case, another RICO case for their involvement in gambling, in money laundering, and in a variety of other criminal activities. So there's no reason to suggest that uh, uh, there's been a secession of the activities that generated income for them for the past, you know, 100 years. In March of 2006, several alleged captains, soldiers, and associates were indicted in another federal gambling conspiracy case. Indicted included Peter Toko, nephew of Don Jack Toko, Pete Messina, and reputed street boss Jackie the Kid Jackaloni, and his driver and bodyguard, Davy the Donut Aceto. Toko, Messina, and Aceto all pled guilty but Jackie the Kid went to trial in March of 07 and was acquitted on all charges. I think the Mafia, or the La Cosa Nostra in Detroit, it, it's still here, it's still viable, it will still be here. This is what these guys know, this is how they were brought up, it's inbred in them, it's in their blood. And the syndicate is, is rooted in family, I mean in the family. same family names a, it, exactly. that were running the family in 1930 are exactly. running the family in 2009. Um, they are still a very viable family. They are cloaking themselves in legitimate business, if you will, a lot more now than ever. Um, but I'm not saying they're doing legitimate business. And they're still doing the same thing today they were doing 20 years ago. And so the games will still be the yeah. same. The faces will change. You know, Jack Tucker was the longest serving LCN boss in the United States. They, they are just very good. They're very smart. They don't have internal strife that generates public opinion or, or public reaction. They don't go to the press, they don't go to the cops. They keep everything very low key, and this has worked to their advantage. It's a very select, very small group of people. The mafia has a history in this country of over 100 years. Uh, it's been said to be dead on numerous occasions. Much like uh, Mark Twain, I think the reports of its demise have been greatly exaggerated. These people have spent their entire lives doing one thing. People still like to bet on sports. People still engage in the vices that have made the LCN successful in the past. And I see no reason to anticipate that that's going to change in the foreseeable future. We're standing outside the Stage Deli off Orchard Lake Road. Stage Deli's been around here for quite a, uh, quite a long time and uh, is actually a, a popular meeting place for guys like Alan Hilf and Jackie Jackaloni. Uh, it's off Orchard Lake Road, which over the last five to ten years has become kind of a mobile headquarters for Jack or Jack, Jackie Jackaloni, Jackie the Kid, uh, Jackie the Bathrobe, Jackie V as the nicknames he goes by. Realistically, Jackie's been running the street probably since the mid-90s after the Gam Tax bust and uh, his uncle Tony Jack uh, got sick with cancer. Uh, Jackie you know, won't, won't, won't have meetings in cars or uh, at his house. Uh, he prefers you know, doing a, doing a drive up and down Orchard Lake Road every day, meeting people at different locations. He'll take a, one of his lieutenants and just kind of walk the aisles at Best Buy or Kmart and tell him what he needs. So uh, from a very early age, Jackie was kind of being groomed. And as of today, we sit today, he is the heir apparent. He will take over from Jack Toko when Jack passes. And, and finally, the Jack Lonies who have really been uh, on the street for the, for, the, for, the, for the entirety of their careers, all the way since the 1930s and 40s, will finally get one of their own at the very top on the throne. Jack. There has been some form of Sicilian organized crime in the United States for nearly 120 years. It is a dark thread woven through the tapestry of American culture, and nowhere in the country has La Cosa Nostra made itself more a part of the community than in Detroit. As the second decade of the new millennium opens, boss Jack Toko enters his 30th year of power and is the longest serving Don in America, just as his predecessor Joe Zarelli was before him. The Detroit family has adapted to the changing world around them, always staying one step ahead of the law, and have only preyed upon those that brought themselves into their orbit.
the Detroit La Cosa Nostra truly is America's most successful mafia family.